Well, glory, glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Another first Sunday, another time when the family of God can come together to break bread together and remember what Jesus has done for us. Father, we invite you in to this communion service. We invite you into yes. this time, Holy Spirit. Yes. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place yes. today. Let us receive and hear the truths that you would impart into us yes. as we participate and just participate in this service and break yes. bread together in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Today is first Sunday. Hallelujah. And as I begin to think about the uh, communion coming together today, I thought about, this is what I want to share with you today. I want to share how that Jesus was on the cross. We want to think about the word stretched. Mm. He was stretched. Mm. He was stretched out yes. on the cross. Yes. And in being stretched out on the cross, they represented the love of God. God is willing to receive and to save all who come to him. It does not matter who it is. I have met people who have said, well, I've done such terrible things in my life. God couldn't forgive me for that. Or he can't accept me into that. Or I know that that I'm going to go to hell when I die because of all the things that I've done. But the thing is, they don't have to. They will if they don't accept Jesus because there is no other way other than Jesus. But he loves us so much. He provided, God provided a way. So I just wanted to explain that when we invite Jesus into our hearts, and when we accept him as our Lord and as our Savior, and he comes in, our spirits become alive. And that's what it means, born again. You are born the first time when you're born from your mom. But the second time, we're born of the spirit. Yes. So that's born again. And when, when Jesus comes in and he comes into our spirit, man, and we become born again, but we are spirit, yes. we are soul. And right now, you see my body. Yes. And I see your body. You cannot see the real me. And I can't see the real you. But there is a spirit part of me. That's what Jesus is. Jesus don't just want to be in your spirit. He wants to be a part of your soul. He wants to come into your soul. What is your soul? That's where you make your decisions. That's your thought life. That's when you decide that you want to do this or that. That's your emotions. It's the seat of your emotions. It's what house your emotions and your decision making. Jesus wants to be part of my decision making. Yeah. He wants me to acknowledge him. Yes, amen. You get that our kind of drug people. Me to say, you know, Father, as I'm driving, go before me, lead, guide, and direct me, provide a path for me. Yes. You know, He wants me to acknowledge Him in everything, everything that concerns me concerns Jesus. Yes. So He wants to be in our spirit, but He also wants to be in our soul. Yes. And then, once Jesus is in our soul, it's manifested in what we do. The, our actions change. What we do change. And that's what he wants. So in Sunday school this morning, we talked about what we see with the natural eye is temporary. It's temporal and it's subject to change. Anything that you can see is not going to remain the same. It's going to wax old. It's going to rise. It's going to this whatever is going to disappear because we can see it. And so we need to understand that, that in that spirit part that's born again, that's where we live once we become born again. 
We need to become aware of what's happening in the spirit realm. How does things work in the kingdom of God? That's what we have to realize because we're so used to living in this earthly realm. We're so used to do we eat, sleep, we do everything in this realm. So on purpose, we have to think about the spiritual realm and how does God want me to do things. So I just want you to understand that part because that is so important. Only what's done in the spirit realm is going to last. I've been to a lot of funerals, a lot of homegoings, and I have never seen a Brinks truck, Come on now. a U-Haul, a moving van. Come on. You got to be careful what you even put on the folk that you're putting in the ground because when you leave, the people will take it off. <laughs> My grandmother used to say, don't put nothing valuable on them, baby. No. Come on now. So you can't take nothing with you. So only what we do in our spiritual life. So there on the cross, I'm going to read Luke 23 and 34. And it says, Jesus' arm remained outstretched. It was saying not because of the nails. Because in Luke 23 and 34, it said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His arms was outstretched because of his love for us. Yes. And you know how like when you're going through something and you know you can just run into the arms of somebody and they can put them and they can just kind of comfort you and tell you it's going to be all right. Well, Jesus' arms are outstretched today. Yes. They're wide open. And even though he's not on the cross, his arms are still open. Yes, amen. He said, what are you going through? What are you facing? What is the situation that you need help with? Jesus says. Yes, amen. That's come right. On now. Come on. Yeah. Yes. Come on now. And he's come waiting on. for yes. us to come to him. Yes. And when we come to him, he will receive us and he will comfort us. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With that in mind and your articles in hand. Yes. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26 reads, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I want to invite you to do a self-examination. Come on now. You know, whenever we do communion, we want to make sure that we're in the right uh, fellowship with God, that there is nothing blocking the line. You know, when you go to turn your faucet on, you expect for the water to flow. And if the water does not flow out, then something is wrong. Something is blocking the line. So we don't want the line blocked. Amen. We want to be able to get through. We want to be able to reach God, and he wants to reach us, okay? So let's do a self-examination. If you can look inwardly, if you can close your eyes, you know, focus on Jesus, not the person next to you or in front of you. Hallelujah, Jesus. And if you can just look, you know if you thought wrong or said wrong or done something wrong. I know I do. I do. I know. Me too. Me too. You too, pastor. Yes. You too, apostle. Yes. You too, teacher. Yes. <laughs> I, I know. 
We were at the restaurant yesterday celebrating my grandbaby's birthday. And it was three little rolls left in the bag. And before I left my son's house, I had told my daughter, my, my daughter, I said, give me a bag, a little, little bag. And she gave me a little bag. And them little rolls that was left, I said, they gonna, I thought to myself, they're going to throw these in the garbage anyway. And I put them in the little bag, put them in my purse. And so, next long after that, the man came over, the waiter, the server. And my husband said, the bread was so good, it sure would be good to have some of that to go. And then the waiter said, oh, the, you can take bread out. But we'll have to have it made from the back. And then, you know, you can take it with you for a charge. Where I had these three little pieces of bread. They wasn't bread, but they was bread. And he just said we had to pay for them. And I said, oh, God, I got this bread down in my purse. And I said, oh, God, I, would, I didn't pull the bread out. I didn't pull it out. God, I didn't pull it out. I just <laughs> left it. Because it was in the bag and they were going to throw it to God anyway. So I said, oh, God, I got this bread down in my purse. And so we went on and tipped the man and did everything we did. And when we got home, my husband said, you know that bread. So I said, here you go, son. Here you go, some bread. I got his three of them left. I know you like them. I got He said, oh, you, are, you got it? I said, yeah, I had put them in my purse. But I didn't know I had to pay for them before the man said it. But he was going to do a dozen if we paid for them. But either way, I had the bread in my purse. So I publicly confess as I take communion today. God forgive me for taking the bread off the table. I'm so used to going along with one and stuff the bread. You can just get the bread. It's free. It's free for you. So I'm going to go out the back and get you. But this here bread, I shouldn't have took it, God. Forgive you for me. But I sure got the bread. It's at home waiting for my husband. <laughs> what did you do? Did you take some bread or more did you take a cookie? <laughs> Y'all did something. Don't be looking at me. I ain't the only one. I ain't the only one. It's a self-examination. Hallelujah. So come on. Seriously, let's pray. Father, today in the name of Jesus Christ, we do come before you. And we thank you, Father, because your word says if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, before we participate in communion today, we do want you to look on our hearts and take out everything that's not like you. We ask that you would forgive us, Father. Father, if we missed the mark, if we said, Father, done anything that was displeasing to you, Father God. Father, we ask that you would cleanse us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now that we're clean and I'm forgiven, hallelujah. Let's take the wafer. This little wafer just represents the body of our Lord and our Savior. It's not the body. It's just a representation. And in the scripture that I read, it said, as often as you do yes. this, sometimes my husband and I do this at home. You can do it every day. You know, it's no certain times. But it's so special when the believers come together on first Sunday or whenever you do it and do it together. So with this little wafer, we just want to lift it up and let's just kind of break it. It symbolizes what Jesus went through on the cross when we break it. And Father, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross in our place. And Jesus, we thank you because of all that you suffered. We believe you, Jesus. We believe that you died on the cross for us. You gave your life. We believe that you're coming back again. We don't doubt that as we partake together. Lift our cups. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the precious blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you that your blood washed us and cleansed us and it redeemed us back. It was the atoning that we needed for our sins. 
And we thank you that there's power in the blood of Jesus. Yes. Flows to the highest mountain and then it goes to the lowest valley. We thank you for your blood as we partake together. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for these moments that we can spend in your presence. Yes, Lord. We can remember your love for us and we'll never forget that outstretched arms of our Savior who is there for us right now yes. to come to him. Yes. And it's in Jesus' name we yes. pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. And I know it was the blood. Come on, y'all. And I know it was the blood. Yes. And I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost. He died on the cross, and I know it was the blood for me. It was my Savior's blood. It was my Savior's blood. It was my Savior's blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And I know it was blood for me. The blood came streaming down. The blood came streaming down. The blood came streaming down for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And I know it was blood for me. Didn't say a mumbling word. No, he didn't. He, he didn't, didn't say, say a mumbling word. word. He, he didn't, didn't say, say a mumbling word, word for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank Bless you, the name Jesus. of Jesus. And thank you, Lord. Thank you. To God be the glory. Well, I want to welcome everyone to another one of our New Life Spirit Side Chats. And this chat is going to be awfully brief today because I got some fathering things to do. <laughs> and I have to get on target to do them. So I want to welcome everyone to another one of our Spirit Side Chats. And I want to continue chatting with everybody about being uh Christ's nature that is his grace God and nature continued who am I in Christ his submissive servant part 1.5 <laughs> okay. because we get part two in two weeks <laughs> so as believers and disciples we have to know what this is so father in the name of Jesus we come before you give you glory and honor we come before you magnifying your name and praising you, Father God. Thank you for this word is mm -hmm, delicious. And we thank you, Father God, for allowing us to be partakers of your word. We pray all this in the mighty name of your dear son, Jesus, and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have your Bibles, there's only one scripture that I want you to turn to today. And I just want to go ahead and review some things because we're not going to come together again for another two weeks. And then we'll go through part two of this. But I want us to pay attention to what Peter is telling us. Peter, who is symbolic of the church. So turn with me to our anchor scripture that started this all off last week. And that is 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25. And I'm going to be reading it out of the New King James Version. And it says this, and we've read it before. Servants, be submissive to your masters. How many servants we have in here? How many servants we have in here? Then you're supposed to be submissive to your masters. How many of you know that a servant has a master? Amen. Amen. <laughs> a servant has a master or else you would not be called a servant. Mm -hmm. See, but in this scripture, what Peter's telling us, which is representative of the church and what the church must know, is that the masters that he's talking about is authorities. It's all about being respectful of authority or, or respectful of authorities. 
And I'm going to tell you something. A lot of us in the body of Christ, I'm talking about in the body of Christ, not even the world, have a problem with that. Yeah. About being respectful to authorities. Yeah. I've seen where there were some people who went off on their pastors. Mm, Jesus, yes. In the yes. middle of the pulpit. Yep. Not at all. So Christ here, see, if you're going to be the church, if you, you can't play church, you got to be the church. And what Christ is telling us through Peter here, what Christ is telling his church is that you must be submissive to your masters. You must be submissive to authority with all fear. Now, that fear means reverence. That means that it's with complete respect. You guys listening to that? That's what we talked about last week. With complete respect. Huh? Yeah. So don't be disrespectful for those who have authority over you. But look at what he says here. He says, not only the good and the gentle, but also the harsh. That's a mouthful that we talked about last week. This is not only to the godly people of authority. And that, you know. Like I just explained, some of us don't even have respect for the godly authority, you know, like your mama and your papa, mm. <laughs> you know, regardless of what your mama and your papa ever done to you. Because what you got to understand is that it's not about your daddy. It's not about your mother. It's all about Christ. Mm. And you have a goal that you're trying to get to after this living. And you got to be able to believe that. So this is not only the godly authority, but also the unpleasant, the ungentle, and in, retro in, in retrospect, evil authority. Mm. Christ is not, he's not mincing any words. He's talking about evil authority. You guys with me on this? Because there's some people out here that are evil. Mm. Yeah. I was telling my son the other day, listen, man. What you got to understand is that those who are not in Christ Jesus and those who are in Christ Jesus are suspect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the very core and the heart of man lies evil. Oh, yeah. People will do things to you just to see you react. That's right. And they will do things to you because they're jealous of you. That's right. You can be godly and they want to, as pastors say, mm -hmm. knock you off that road. Mm so he's talking about also the ungodly, the evil. And in our lives, we will be approached with evil authority. But you've got to treat them with respect. That's right. You know how you kill evil? With love. Yeah. That's what you do. That's how you kill it. You may not see it now, but that's how you kill it. Yeah. I've had people that have been so evil to me that I just compliment them up the yin-yang. Mm -hmm. And then they turn around <laughs> and they're evil to everybody else, but they're not evil to me. <laughs> you guys understand this? Mm -hmm. For this is commendable. If because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongly, which means that we can endure suffering for being godly. You can do everything that is right. And you can go to people and say, I don't understand why I'm treated this way. I've done everything right. Well, that's because you've done everything right. Yeah. right. That's the reason why they're treating you like that. But God. So we can endure suffering for being righteous or for being right. Who do you think he is? Mm -hmm. Who she thinks she is? Just for being nice. Mm -hmm. But Christ says this, he says, for this is commendable if because of conscience. Now that conscience he's talking about is consciousness. What is conscious, y'all? That's being aware that if you are aware that you're doing this for God, everything I do, and put it on me now, I do for Christ. That is being a father, that is being a husband, that is being a friend, that's being a pastor. Because I'm going to tell y'all something. If it wasn't for Jesus, I'd be out there. I know my personality. I know what the dead man's personality was. I would be out there. Faking the funk in front of all y'all. Deceiving all of y'all. Y'all understand me? See, see, humanity can do that. Right? 
Well, I can always go to the board and say, ain't no money today, board. <laughs> <laughs> you guys understand me? <laughs> Look at what he says here. He says, for this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief. That means that you are aware and you do it because of God suffering wrongly. We, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults? And remember, we talked about last week how your faults can be good or they can be evil. See, faults are not just a bad word, right, Will? Faults can be good. I can have good, tremendous faults, right? Yeah. Hmm? He says, he says, so for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? That means that I'm taking it because of me, because I'm good. I, I'll take it and I'll go ahead and be this martyr because it's all about me. God does not respect that. No. You know, he doesn't respect anything that is selfish. See, God is a selfless God. That's the reason why, that's the reason why he is a forgiving God. But when you do good and suffer, when you do what? Good, good is godly. When you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently because of God, this is commendable be before God. Look, let me say this. If we are godly and suffer for it and are not vengeful when this is uh, and not vengeful, then this is worthy praise to God. You want to know how you can praise him? Take somebody's mess that's trying to destroy you. Mm -hmm. And look and see what God will do for you. You can't touch what belongs to God, nor can you destroy what is his property. And see, we've got to believe that through and through. For this you were called before, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us what? An example that you should follow his steps. If ever you want an example of anything, Look at the example of what is good. Yes. I did not say what is perfect because nothing in this living is perfect, but there is a lot in this living that is good. Yeah. I often always tell my boys, you want to know what a good marriage looks like? Look at your parents. Now, they know that we don't always agree, right. <laughs> right. but they know that we're not trying to stab each other in our disagreements. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling the truth. You guys understand? Not two people don't always agree about everything. But if you find somebody that you agree with on most things, it works. But that's called knowing the person. So what you want to do is you want to surround yourself with good people so you can see good examples. And the best example you can see is Christ, mm -hmm. is Jesus. This book is the best example that you can have. He says that we should follow his steps. I don't know about you, but those are some large moccasins to follow, to step in, but I'm willing to step in them. Then it goes on here. And this is for next week after next. He goes on to say this, who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth? Yeah. Who, when he was revealed, Reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. How many of us, when we're threatened, don't threaten back? Is it in human nature not to threaten? We call it, I'm defending myself. <laughs> but you got to understand the example that you watch in Christ. Did he have to defend himself? No, he didn't. He didn't say a mumbling word. And then, the, then the, remember the scripture I read to you guys last week where uh, Pontius Pilate said, don't you know that I have the authority <laughs> to kill you? This is basically what he said, or to set you free. And Christ said, you have no other authority than the one which my father has given to you. Mm -hmm. My God, that's powerful. <laughs> that is powerful to look power, to speak truth to power, regardless of the outcome. 
When I can find me people who are not afraid to physically die for what they believe in, then I have found Christ that's resonating on the inside of them. So you're not going to get that, not even in the body of Christ. And Christ knows it. Yeah. That's the reason why he's coming back to take us out of here first. That's the rapture, y'all. Mm -hmm. Pray for the rapture because you don't want to be around here for that other nonsense. Mm -hmm. Because we can't take it. I think it was Minister JJ who said, no, you can't take it. Because if he left you here and they say you can't you can't uh, uh, have milk or meat or anything without these sixes on your hand or your forehead, you'd be like, <laughs> we can't. That's the reason why Jesus came. Look, 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 look at what he says. But committing himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live. Look, look, live. He didn't say have life. He said live because it's about a right now thing. Live because you've got to set the example. Live for righteousness. Then that dash there is a continuation. It's a pause, but it's a continuation of the same thought by whose stripes you were healed. What does this have to do with Submitting under authority. What does the stripes of Christ and healing have to do with submission and servant and, and, and being a servant? Well, you find out in two weeks. Look, look, look what he says here. By whose stripes you were healed. He didn't say by whose stripes you are healed. He said were. Past tense. Y'all better pay attention. To the text. Look, 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 look. For you were like what? Sheep going astray, but now, but have now returned. You guys see that? Returned to the shepherd and overseer of your what? Souls. This is not about your body. Oh, Jesus. Oh, you guys better pay attention. So in a couple of weeks, I'm about to tell you that what of uh, that of which I have received from the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. and what I received from Him is deep. Mm -hmm. For those of us who are theologians and always make a prayer about the stripes of Christ, in fact, as I said last week, this is going to be so deep and powerful that some may choose not to even believe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And that's all right. You're right. You're right, my sister wife. That's all right. But remember this. Remember we talked about last week that many disciples left Jesus mm -hmm. because they could not take what he said about what we just did in communion, which is eating his body and drinking his blood. Uh, blood. Yeah. And that is what we just did. See, we did that spiritually with natural artifacts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They did not understand such revelation. But as I said to you last week, Peter did. Peter, who is the church, did. So that tells you something about the church. That tells us, and remember that the church is supposed to be deep. Y'all understand this? Yes. Yeah. We're not supposed to be surfaced. Huh? But so many of us teach and we preach surface where people don't get nothing edified in their spirit, man, because they know nothing. They come in just as dumb as they were spiritually. They go out just as dumb as they were spiritually, leaving up out of a facility that is supposed to be a place of provoking. They know nothing. The church is where we're supposed to go and get revelation. You hear me, son? It's supposed to be the place where we go. Therefore, you ask the church. I ask the church. Pay attention, y'all. It's supposed to be in a place where people can come to get revelation. 
When you sit down and you minister to people, don't minister to them selfishly. Take them in. If they stay with you, take them glory to glory to glory. I call it depth by depth by depth into the what revelation of what God is actually saying to those who love him, which produces inspiration and not motivation, which lasts a second. But inspiration lasts a lifetime. It is a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. Yes, wife. This is not supposed to, you know, the church is not supposed to be a social club. No. But yet they are. I put on my nice gown, my nice, beautiful suit. You know, I go and I listen to these eloquent words that mean nothing to me, but I just want to let God know that I was there. And I socialize with the people who are socially, economically inclined with me. Or either I'm socializing with people to let them know that I know more than them and they need to come up to my level. Yeah. The church was never supposed to be a social club, a place where we meet socially yeah. and discuss nothing. It's supposed to be a place that provoke you. Provoke you by opening up your Bible and saying, is this true what is said in here, Lord? This is to provoke us to live from the inside out and not to live from the outside in, but to live one with Christ. The two things, and I'm done, the two things that God wants us to carry away. Remember I said, which are what? Why are we to be submissive servants? Well, we had that answer from last week because when we submit ourselves to all authority, it glorifies God. Have you tried my servant Job? When he said to Lucifer, what Job did glorified God and that was evil authority that he submitted himself under. You guys understand it? We're supposed to have the spirits of what? Job. And then the second thing, what was actually healed from the stripes of Christ? That's the question we need to answer. But in order to know that one, as I said, one must know what the stripes of Christ are or is. We get it twisted. Oh, man, I like to go into it right now because it's true. We get it twisted. Right. And you must meet me back here in two weeks to find that out. Remember the questions also within that one question that I want you to ponder while thinking about this for two weeks. And that is, can flesh, that is the natural body be healed? Can it be healed? And if so, if you say it can be, then why does it die? A lot to unpack in two weeks. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor. We praise and magnify your name. We glorify you. We thank you for this opportunity to come together just to just praise your holy name and to glorify you, Father. We thank you, Father God, for allowing us to be obedient and strengthening us to be obedient to your word. And we count it all joy, my Lord, as we come together corporately to glorify you and to learn from the feet of the master as we submit ourselves as a servant. Mm. Bless each and every household that is under the sound of my voice. Let those who are on these devices and those who are in this facility not walk up out of here in the same manner which they walked in but let there be a renewness of living, one that will provoke us all to open up our Bibles and to become one with you. I pray this in the mighty name of your dear son, Jesus, and through my Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I say amen, mm -hmm. amen, and amen. Remember, there will be no spirit side chat service next week. No, There'll be no Sunday school next week. Uh, because... I got some buddies that's going to be celebrating. And I got a son that is awesome. So 
we won't have service next week, but but all the following week, we'll be right here waiting to finish up what God has given us on his submissive servant on August 20th, <laughs> the day of uh, <laughs> my wife's uh, birthday and also my buddy's anniversary. So we'd be celebrating two things on that Sunday, y'all. And also we'd be celebrating, but most more importantly, we'd be celebrating Christ. Amen. 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 I'm going to turn this all back over to uh, Pastor A. Amen. Thank you, guys. Look forward to seeing you guys in two weeks. God bless you. Amen. Bye-bye. You know what, when it